Welcome back to another episode of the Moments of Joy podcast. I'm very excited to share with you today our special guest, Teresa Geralimo. Now, over the past few months, I've been having conversations with her about autism, about autism research, how it's done, and who's not represented in these studies. And Teresa's here today to educate us, and I'm so excited. Um, she's going to introduce herself to you guys, and then we're going to get right into the conversation. Teresa, would you introduce yourself? Thank you, Camille. Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa, and I am an assistant professor in the School of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences at San Diego State University. Before I entered the world of research, I was a special education teacher of high school age autistic students. And right now I am a language and autism researcher and I work primarily with black and Hispanic or Latina autistic adolescents and young adults who vary quite a bit in their language skills and in how they use language. And a very important part of my work is thinking about the disparities that exist not only in research, but in real life that impact the lives of autistic individuals themselves. And I am committed to trying to use research to mitigate those gaps. Yes, I, I learned something new about you today. I didn't know that you were a teacher. Mm -hmm. Wow, and so is that what fuels the fire for you to go deeper into this? You know what? It was. When I did my special education training, I worked as a public school teacher by day and did my coursework to get a master's in teaching at night. Mm. And as I was going through my classes and reading different types of papers for schoolwork and talking about what I was learning in classes, I realized that the students I served and their families were not the ones I was necessarily reading about in my coursework. And that wow. really drove me down a path to um, try to conduct research that is more inclusive and representative of the whole autistic population. Mm -hmm. Now, this was very important to me because I'm researching all the time. And I'm always saying studies show that parents raising children with special needs or something of that matter. I'm always talking about studies. And so to hear that most of the time, the studies that we read are not, um, you know, fully representative to black and brown people, I was kind of shocked. I would have never even thought about that at all. And for that, my response would be, I learned so much from participants and their families, meaning autistic individuals themselves and their families, who are stellar advocates, and they know what their experiences are and what it is they need. In that case, I would say that researchers are falling short of their duties to the scientific community and to the community of readers out there who are going to be reading their papers. For instance, um, I recently did a systematic review, meaning I looked at all papers on language in autistic school age individuals. And when I looked at the dimensions of language that have to do with language impairment, so things like vocabulary skills or overall language skills, I found with my colleagues that most studies didn't even bother reporting race or ethnicity at all, or other things that can impact who gets to be in the evidence base, like socioeconomic status. And that was very shocking to me and also highly concerning. Wow, it, it is highly concerning because um, that would kind of make some of the research inaccurate, correct? I would say, Perhaps not inaccurate without testing it, but what I would certainly say is I would never take an evidence base formed on only part of the population to develop policies, diagnostic mm. criteria, assessments, or practices for the entire autistic population. And that is just a glaring gap that research has to address. Yeah. And, and I remember um, the first time we began to have these conversations, I, I, I really felt like I don't even know why I was surprised. 
Um, but I was shocked. Um, mainly because I would have never thought about it. Um, but also, you know, I shouldn't have been shocked because these types of things have always been going on and it, and it is some form again of systemic racism. It definitely is. Um, and in my own experience, I've had two different types of reactions from people, if you will. So on one hand, I work with researchers who are maybe working with these racially and ethnically, you know, minoritized individuals, isn't their primary area of focus, but they are willing to give me their time and energy and resources to carry out that work, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. On the other side, sometimes when I talk about issues with systemic racism in research, yeah. which is nothing new, the National Institute you know, for health runs webinars and workshops on this topic. People say, oh, well, we don't really think, you know, racism is that much of an issue in research methods. We don't really think we're not concerned. Right. And I think, you know, I don't even know if we're reading the same book. I can have right. a dialogue with people, but they also have to be in a place where they're willing to show some of that cultural humility and that maybe they aren't the experts in everything autism just because they happen to do, you know, one type of autism research. Right. And um, you would think that we would be included, but you, you, you taught me about reasons why they say that we're not in it. And one reason was because of our hair. Our hair is thick and, it, and sometimes they would have issues um, reading it. Um, you know, in MRIs and other tests that they do for epilepsy and autism? Correct. So with, I do neuroimaging for part of my research, and that is called functional near-infrared spectroscopy. And it's nice because it doesn't make individuals enter a small, noisy space like an MRI bore. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you have very long, you know, straight, coarse hair like mine, or natural textured hair, or natural textured hair that is perhaps in a protective, uh, protected hairstyle, mm -hmm. then the cap that I use for functional near-infrared spectroscopy, that neuroimaging instrument, is not necessarily inclusive of all hair types. Mm. And so when you think about how hair type oftentimes coincides with maybe other things like skin pigmentation, right? you know, you have to stop and say, what is going on here? And again, like in these studies that I read of using NEARS to look at language and autism, they don't really talk about this as a limit to the quality of research. Wow. I, yeah. <laughs> every, every time I talk to you, I'm just, I'm lost for words and annoyed. Um, and, and just grateful for you, a person who isn't even African-American, you know, taking a look and saying, okay, wait a minute, you know, something's wrong here. And we are including these people in the research when so many African-American children are being diagnosed with autism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just the macro data on diagnosis are alarming. I, I know some of these trends have changed over time, but from what I recall, if you were Black or African-American or Hispanic or Latinx, and they didn't even include Asian and Pacific Islanders or Native American or Indigenous individuals because there were too few of them to use mm. in the analyses, mm -hmm. they were getting diagnoses later than white autistic children, mm. needing more time after getting you know that later diagnosis in services, and then also getting other diagnosis, other diagnoses first, even though the, the right diagnosis should have been autism. So something wow. like um, misconduct disorder or oh, ADHD. Wow. And yeah. Woo. That, that is so true because when we think about the, um, you know, inner city schools, a lot of children have or are diagnosed with ADHD in school and I now that my son is autistic I'm always looking back at my own classroom and I said you know what in, in fifth grade so-and-so was probably autistic 
you know, <laughs> or in fourth grade, he was, he or she was probably autistic and knowing that they probably didn't get the right diagnosis. Totally. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll just say this. So I actually recently underwent the diagnostic process as well. Yes. And I have a lot to say. So yes. when I was four, you know, before you enter kindergarten and I went to public school in New York state in upstate New York, they have you go into the school to do kind of a developmental screening. And I did not do well on that screening per whatever the school benchmarks were. Mm -hmm. um, so between this, that, and another thing, my parents ended up taking me to quite a few clinics where they do screening and assessments um, for autism and other types of, you know, parental concerns or developmental delays. Yeah. And I was a late talker. As in, I was not speaking until well after two, which I know is a common sign for many parents that maybe something is a little off. Right. And I wish I had the report in front of me, but I have all, I actually had this conversation with my um, mom in adulthood where she said, you know, what they told us at the clinic was, well, she shows this communication delay and we know something like, we're validating your concerns. And she has, you know, like issues with using verbal communication and in interacting, you know, appropriately or whatever. But Asians are usually smart. And, you know, flash forward, you know, decades later, I found myself thinking of, well, how in the heck do I even find someone who does adult diagnosis, mm -hmm. who understands autism in women? who also understands autism if you're not white. So thinking about those intersectional concerns of being right. a woman, being Asian, right. and then, you know, also being an adult, I'm 36. <laughs> right, right. I mean, we wouldn't even think that those things matter, but that's why conversations like this mm -hmm. are so important, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so you got, you got a diagnosis of autism. Yeah, so when I did the process, it was so interesting because I used diagnostic assessments that we often use, you know, like with younger children. And also, if you know the structure of them, they're probably not valid because you know how all the scores work. Right. Um, and the neuropsychologist who did my evaluation um, had all these things to say, such as, oh, Tell me about, you know, like your sensory concerns. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, you know, your routines or adjusting to change. And just hearing uh, the neuropsychologist tell me that things were typical, I mm -hmm. guess, if you will, in mm -hmm. autism or that um, some of the challenges or the patterns, I guess, of social communication, if you will, Mm -hmm. how they can look different in perhaps a professional setting or a university setting and things like that was like opening up my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and on the flip side, when I finally told my husband I was getting an evaluation, his response was, I've been telling you you're autistic for years. Not, <laughs> not, not to be mean, but just because. Yeah. Said, well, this is. Yeah, right. because we knew. <laughs> wow. Wow. So 36. Um, that that's so important, even for Asians that might be listening or see this on social media, you know, um, that that there can be an autism diagnosis because it, it really has nothing to do with race at all. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so when we talk about making a change or, um, you know, being involved, how can parents um, do something to make a difference in research? I think one thing parents can do is if they are interested in taking part in research, whether as participants or as partners in the research process, definitely let somebody know. Maybe that could be voicing this to your local college or university or in a parent support group. Um, I'll bring up my our mutual friend, Kyle, just as an example mm -hmm. here. Yes. So 
when I met Kyle, he was thinking about doctoral programs. So we connected over that because I love mentorship and I know it's important to be a very good, I guess, someone who's going to help remove gatekeeping, right? From mm. entering higher education. Wow. And so I mentored Kyle on some of the doctoral education piece. And he said, you know, I need to get to know you because you help me all the time and you talk about my interests and how to help me with work. But what about you? Mm. So then it came out that I was a language and autism researcher. And he said, you know, I have twins who wow. are neurodivergent and one of them is autistic. And I said, okay. And I discovered that part of his interest in pursuing a doctoral degree was a passion for autism research that would increase kind of representation. Yeah. So that really got him involved with both my research because now we work together on projects. Mm -hmm. And also with going out and talking to community stakeholders who are interested in seeing their communities be in research. And also, of course, folks who want like resources from that research to go back into their communities. Right. So this is this is um something that will not just benefit your child, but it'll benefit the community as a whole. So if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you are going to school yourself and you want to make change in your community, this is how you get connected um, to research. And then when you hear things or see things that might pop up online that say, you know, we're doing a research project on children with autism, you can sign up for things like that. And yep. I think it's so necessary. And I and I went through the research process with you. Well, a mock research. <laughs> um, and it was painless. Um, you know, it was virtual and it and it was easy. And I think um for, at, for parents, letting your voice be heard is so needed and necessary as we, you know, move on to fight for change even in this space. And I think something else I could tack on is for any parents or autistic individuals out there who are thinking about participating in research, it is fair to be skeptical and to ask for things in return. Uh, I know that I have had community stakeholders ask me point blank about, well, what are you going to do with this research? Are you going to work with people from our community and train them to be researchers? And the answer is yes. Um, yeah. I think for any researcher out there, it's fair to think about how are you going to develop a true partnership with people from the community and think of ways that your research can be mutually beneficial. And I know with you, Camille, as I think about doing different types of research projects, like writing a grant, for example, to think about what are ways to do language sampling and learn more about the language skills of all different types of autistic individuals. Mm -hmm. Researchers can do things like ask community stakeholders, parents to join them in research, you know, in roles with compensation or with whatever it is that the community stakeholder thinks would be fulfilling and fair. Yeah, I am thinking about speech therapy as a whole and um, even outside of a diagnosis, children are getting speech therapy in, um, you know, early intervention, you know, so therapists are going to schools, daycares, and even at your home. And so research will help even to change those techniques. Yes, they will. And if we do it right, research should also hopefully help impact policy making for things mm. like provision of services and service eligibility. Um, I don't think I have time to get into this today. Yeah, but I, I was like, oh, I want to go there because the policy changing, we, we, we don't, we don't tap into that. And it's, it's, it's necessary for us to, 
um, so many laws are in place and we complain, especially, uh, you know, in my community, we complain a lot about a lack of resources and things that are not available. And, and we have to have a voice in this space. So I, I, we have time. We have a little time. I would love for you to go there. Okay. Um, so I know that in theory, if we're thinking about, let me give an example. So I suppose some parents here might be familiar with the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition, also known as the DSM-5, which is, yes. is, right, that's used for diagnosis. And I know it overlays with the ICD for things like healthcare reimbursement and what health insurance reimbursement and things like that. But as far as the DSM-5 goes, when they were making the criteria for autism spectrum disorder, part of that process included doing a systematic literature review, meaning people looked at all the research out there that had to do with characteristics of autistic individuals themselves. And if you think about the fact that the evidence base mm. and participants in studies are mostly, you know, white, mostly autistic individuals who tend to have, you know, fluent verbal skills for how they use language and typical or above, you know, nonverbal intelligence, meaning they're not those individuals who are autistic with an intellectual disability. Right. Um, it's a little bit frightening to think that, well, those, those are the diagnostic criteria and who are they based on? And who right. are they probably less likely to be based on? Mm. And, you know, that really shapes how you know, states and local education agencies think about policies and services based on those criteria. Right. So if the research doesn't show a need for the increase of support or, you know, more AAC devices to be covered by insurance or things... <laughs> things like that, then why would they press it if the research doesn't show that it, it's it's needed, right? Correct. And I think being researchers being more direct about the implications of research findings and gaps mm -hmm. in the research literature can help to drive home some of those points. So I know with some movements um, or voices, I guess, in kind of the autism field, there's many different perspectives on how to think about autism, whether it's maybe saying, hey, there is nothing wrong with being autistic to saying, well, my child has all these unmet needs. Mm -hmm. And when I listen to these different voices and think about policy, I think the take home point is very clear. And that is that research has to be more representative. And when it is thinking about the services and policies, to address the unmet needs of autistic individuals themselves and families, because also like if you have an autistic child and you're a parent, right. it probably impacts the rest of your family. Oh yes. Um, if your child has unmet needs. So it's maybe not the autism itself, but the unmet needs can certainly have cascading impacts that we need to mitigate. Yeah. Wow. Teresa, every time you talk, I hang up the conversation. I'm like, Wow, it's a lot to take in, um, but it is something that one person at a time, we can make change. You know, <laughs> someone like you partnering with, you know, different people can make change around the United States. Um, and so is there anything else you would like to share before we wrap up? Not really. I think you may share a flyer for a study that I am currently doing. Yes. And I would certainly welcome anyone who is interested to contact me um, to ask questions, voice concerns. And I'm happy to talk about both what the study is and what the big picture is of why I am doing this work in collaboration with people like Kyle and other individuals out there. Yes. And how, what is your email for, and how can they get in touch with you? Okay. So they can get in touch with me on Twitter. Um, 
I welcome, you know, direct messages. You can tweet at me. I'll put that into the chat and you can share it. Um, they can also get in touch with me at my website, which has my email on there. Okay. So that's Teresa Geralimo underscore and then www.teresageralimo.com. And I'll put this in the description of the show so you guys can see it as well. She is not on Instagram, but when I post this conversation, I'll leave all of how you guys can contact her there. So thank you so much, Teresa, for joining today. I look forward to more conversations with you, doing more, uh, you know, work with you to create change. And I'm excited. If there's any last message that you can leave with the parents, what would you say? You are the experts of your own lives and experiences. Your autistic child is an expert in their own experiences. Researchers are not experts in your lives or experiences. The most we can do is try to do ethical and inclusive research to try and learn more, and then use scientific tools to try and characterize what we think is happening, but you are the experts of your own lives. Thank you so much. That's good. All right, guys, don't forget that new episodes are released every single Wednesday and you always have the option to choose joy. Bye-bye.